Hey, good morning. How we doing? Awesome. That sounded like nothing, but I'm <laughs> so glad that you guys are relaxed and just in a meditative zone. As a kid, I was not relaxed as a kid. Nope, not at all. I was scared of the dark, really scared of the dark as a kid. In fact, one night, uh, I slept on the, I usually, my bedroom's on the second floor of the house, and we had our windows open. It was summer. We didn't have air conditioning. And I heard something crunching and munching and stomping outside of my room, outside the window. I was very scared. So I did what any normal kid would do. I went and got mom. And I was like, mom, mom, there's something outside my window. So she came. She looked outside my window, which I did not have the courage to do. She's like, Travis, the cows are just eating grass right outside your window. My room backed up to the pasture, and they were just having a little midnight snack. I thought it was a monster. It was not. It was just cows. And I got bad news, kids. This is for you, kids. This is adults, you can just tune out. I wish cows were the only thing I had to be afraid of. But as you get older, you find out like all sorts of stuff to be afraid of. It's scary. It's a scary world. Before you just put it off, now as an adult, I'm like, wait, it's way scarier than cows now. It's way more terrifying. There's all sorts of news stories. There's things happening all over the place. I got to worry about finances, people having surgeries, all sorts of stuff, sicknesses. You got you to watch what you eat. I'm deathly afraid that Chick-fil-A is going to be the death of me. It's a sweet death, but I'm okay with it. We have a lot to be afraid of. And we live in a world where fear kind of drives a lot of things. It kind of runs in the background of our lives. But every once in a while, something breaks, some news story happens, something happens in our life where fear becomes front and center. And if you're a person of faith, if you're a follower of Jesus, you want to know, where's Jesus when I'm afraid? How do I reach him when I'm, a, I'm scared? Do I have like a, a red hotline phone I can just pick up and be like, Jesus, I need help. And so today, we're, we're, as Brandon talked about, we're looking at the seven I am statements of Jesus. This is one of the most famous ones. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We're going to talk about where Jesus is in the midst of our fear. It's in John chapter 14, which is where we'll be. John chapter 14. And I want us to see the three things, three things, that Jesus offers to us in the midst of our fear. Three things. And the first one is this. He offers us hope. He offers us hope. Look at verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. We're in the midst of the Last Supper. This is the last meal that Jesus is having with his disciples. And he's dropped some bombshells on them. I didn't realize until I started reading this verse, this chapter, that he says, starts by saying, let not your hearts be troubled. So I went back to chapter 13. I was like, why are they worked up? He's just washed their feet and he's told them, you are to serve each other the way I just served you. So that's kind of a big deal. But then he tells them that one of them is going to betray him. And then he tells Peter, when Peter says, no, I'm going to go to the ends of the earth with you. And he tells Peter, he's like, nah, man, you're going to deny me three times before the end of the night. And it says they're troubled. Now, we read troubled last week. Troubled last week, Jeff talked about this. Troubled doesn't mean like, oh man, I'm kind of bummed. Troubled is angry, it's frustrated, it's, it's confused even. This is the way Jesus was outside the tomb of Lazarus. That's why he wept, he was so angry, he wept. So here are the disciples, I wouldn't look at them as in like full on rebellion, they're not mad at Jesus, but imagine more of like, no, never, we would never do that. It's a little bit more of an uproar than the casual let not your hearts be troubled paints. And so when I started reading through this chapter, I realized this is what Jesus is telling to these guys who are scared. They're scared because the world that they thought they had, they're scared because everything has been destabilized. They had this vision of them and Jesus ministering together for a long time, and that just got upended. And so they're scared. And so Jesus is going to offer them, uh, within the context of hope, he says they can be hopeful 
because of three reasons. The first one is he's trustworthy. You can trust him. Verse one, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus is saying that despite everything that's happening, they can still trust his words. You can still rely on what I say. And if you can't rely on what I say, remember the things that I've done. I walked on water. I, I, I healed the blind. I've healed the sick. I fed 5,000. I've calmed the storm. Just like two chapters ago, I raised a dead guy to life. If you can't remember what I said, remember what I've done. And trust me. Trust me. This is why it's so important for you and for me when we're, we're in peaceful times, when we're times where we're not quite so scared to be in God's word, to be reading scripture. That's why we need to be doing that. Because when I'm scared, I forget things. I forget what Jesus has told me, unless I've got it in my head, unless it's in a regular pattern. If you wait to reach out to Jesus when you're afraid, if you wait to pick up the red hotline phone, you're not going to know how it works. You're not going to know how to trust him. When I was in the army, we, uh, we trained with our equipment. And one time we, uh, we trained with gas masks. And what they did was they let us all into this bunker and they opened up a can of tear gas. Unpleasant. In the movies, they just put like a tissue over their mouth and they're like, we're going to make it. It's going to be okay. No, you're a mess, an ugly crying mess. But they did it so that we would have confidence in our equipment. They said, when, when you have real gas, you need to worry about. We want you to be able to trust the gas mask. We don't want you to panic. Some of y'all are waiting to reach out to Jesus when you don't know if you can trust him. That's a real, I'm not saying he won't come through for you, not at all. But it's not a smooth ride if that's your plan. He tells them also that they're secure. They're safe. Look at verse 2. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Jesus is saying there's a safe place and it's right beside the father. And this is the ultimate goal. This is where you're going to be. You're going to spend eternity right next to the father in a new heaven and a new earth. And I'm going to prepare a place so that you're safe there. You're going to be proximity to the father. You're going to have access to the father. And we look at that being in a, a New Testament world, being in a church world, and we're like, oh, yeah, okay, new, you know, talking to God. That's not that big of a deal, right? We do that all the time. We do it before our meals. But in their day, they were still in the Old Testament system. And we think, oh, everybody had interactions with God, like Moses and David and Elijah. No, for every one of those, there was like thousands of people that never heard the voice of God didn't have direct access to God. The way they interacted with God was through the temple system. Now, could they pray? Of course they prayed. They prayed all the time. But the kind of unfiltered access that we now enjoy, they had to go through an intermediary. They had to go through the temple system, sacrifices and whatnot. We still have an intermediary, but it is Christ. And he gives us direct access for those who believe in him. And God's, Jesus is saying, you want to be right next to the father. Now, for some of us, we think, man, that being close to the Father, that sounds scary. I've read all the times God shows up, and every time he's like, don't be afraid. Like, if you have to start, it's like when you have to tell people you're the leader. If you have to tell people you're the leader, you're not the leader. Just heads up. <laughs> Sorry. If you have to tell people don't be afraid, it's not because they're like, wow, this is cool. They're terrified. Don't be afraid. So you're thinking to yourself, man, I, 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 is it okay to be next to God? Yes. It's absolutely the safest place to be. Look at Psalm, uh, you'll see it on, the, on the, the screen, Psalm 65, verse 4. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house and the holiness of your temple. Drawing near, being close to God, it's the safest place to be. It's really hard to know where to put your next step when you're afraid. And God says, you need to be near me. Come close to me and I'll, I'll lead you. But then he also talks about faithfulness. He says they can be hopeful because he's faithful. Verse three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. He's gonna go prepare a place and this is gonna be a special place. You know what makes it special? It's not that it's heaven. It's not that there's streets of gold and a pearly gate and all that stuff. 
you're going to go be with me. You're going to be with me. Now, again, think about what he's just told the disciples. You're going to deny me. You're going to betray me. You're not going to wash feet like I tell you to. And what does he say to him? He says, I still want you with me. I still want you near me. I still want you close by me. Now think about the things you've done in your life. Now again, we don't need to compare with denying Jesus and all that. But it sure sounds like Jesus has a habit of going to people who make mistakes and saying, I want you with me. I want you with me. I want you close to me. I go to prepare a place for you. Will you come with me? And our tendency is to when we're afraid, when we're scared, is we dive into things that make us not feel afraid or, or dead in that pain, right? So we go into our addictions or we shop or we, we go into all sorts of stuff, right? Either good or bad. But we want to take away that pain, take away that fear. We don't like that feeling. And so we tend to abandon Jesus. We tend to deny Jesus. We're most at risk to deny Jesus when we're scared. And Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that you can be with me. Stay with me right now. You can be hopeful. You can trust me. You're secure, and I'm not going to abandon you. And that's the hope that he gives us. We've got to cling to that hope when we're afraid. But we don't just get hope. Not that Jesus is just like, yeah, it's a future thing. I'll take care of you. Don't worry. Suck it up. No. He offers us help as well. He offers us help as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to take two verses. I'm going to pull them out here because they're questions from two disciples, Thomas and Philip. They ask two questions. And these two questions are going to help us interact with Jesus offering us help. The first question is in verses four and five. Jesus says, and you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? It's a really practical question. Thomas is like, I, I want to know where you're going. I want to know how to get there. Thomas is a practical disciple. That's why he tr struggles with the resurrection. When he hasn't seen Jesus, he's like, how in the world? What? How? How? People don't come back from the dead. I mean, I know Jesus raised the guy, but that was Jesus. Jesus is dead now. He's not going to raise himself. He's practical. And so Thomas wants a practical answer. And Jesus is talking spiritually, metaphorically. He's saying, I know the, I'm, I'm going to be with my father. You know the where I'm going. You know the way. You know what it's going to be like. And Thomas has got his phone out being like, look, I've put it in Google. It's not coming up, man. Do you have a physical address I can punch in? Thomas just doesn't get it. And we are a lot like Thomas in that Thomas has a lot of things to be afraid of running, on, running in the background of his mind. There's the Roman Empire going on, oppressive. There's terrorism because there's people rebelling against the Roman Empire. There's a whole religious synagogue system that they've all been probably kicked out of at this point because of their allegiance to Jesus. Their families probably have been persecuted by the synagogue. So Thomas has all this stuff going on, but he's, he's managing, he's working through it until Jesus says, by the way, this whole thing that we've been doing for the last three years, it's all about to spin down. It's coming to an end and I'm leaving. And Thomas is like, are you for real? Because like, we're in, we're invested. And so the dam breaks, he's scared. We have the same thing going on. Like I said, we have all these things running on in the back of our mind. And then that one thing happens. Marriage goes through some rough times. We struggle with our singleness. Kids start not being the kids that we thought we would have. Job winds up being rough. And you're like, Jesus, what's the way out of this? Like, just like Thomas, what's the way and how, what's it going to look like when we get there? We ask the same thing. Jesus, what's the way out of this fear and what's it going to look like when I get there? How's it going to be? I want the practical steps. Again, scared of the dark, right? And the th what's scary about the dark? Anybody know what's scary about the dark? Okay, it's the unknown part of it. Somebody in the first service said monsters. And I was like... <laughs> Okay. It's unknown. It's the unknown. You don't know what's in the dark, right? So when you're a parent, you got to dispel that fear for your kids. You typically try to take away the unknowns, right? So you look under the bed and you're like, oh, there's no monsters there. And you go to the closet, no monsters there. You turn on the nightlight, 
to dispel some of that unknown. And that is a great strategy. I encourage you to use it. I have an alternate one for you. It is not as good. Another way to dispel the unknown in the darkness is to tell them everything that could be in the dark. There could be robbers. There could be kidnappers. There could be all this stuff. Draculas, werewolves, zombies. I mean, just go run through the list. Congratulations. They are no longer scared of the dark. Nailed it. They are scared of everything else, but not scared of the dark. And I think we expect Jesus to do that for us, to come by our bedside and be like, all right, look, tomorrow you're going to do this, and then in 10 years you're going to do this, and then in 20 years it's going to be like this. By the way, you're going to struggle with cancer here. By the way, you're going to bury a family member here. And we go, expect, expect to have the chart. They're all charted out for us. And Jesus is like, if I, could, if I did that for you, it would be the same as telling a little kid all the things that could be there that they should be afraid of. It would crush us. You don't really want to know. And you know what? If we did know, we would want to try and navigate it. We would try and take control. We'd try to minimize, even when we came upon the fear that we knew, like, wow, you're going to struggle with this diagnosis, but guess what? I'm going to get you through it. We'd try to avoid it anyway, knowing full well we were going to get through it. That's why Jesus doesn't give us the whole plan. We'd become so overwhelmed. I'll say this. 40-year-old Travis is probably not ready to deal with some of the things that 60-year-old Travis is going to have to deal with. But I believe that if I stick with the Lord, he's going to get me there. And some of the things that I'm going to run into when I'm that age are because I stuck with the Lord. And we've got to be okay with that. The second question comes from Philip. It's in verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Philip's saying, hey, look, Jesus, you're great. Seems like you're leaving. I would like to have something else to satisfy myself. So when you're scared, you have certain things that, that you've used to, to mitigate your fears, right? We have finances, we have insurance, we have all that stuff to kind of keep those fears at bay. But when something happens that you get really scared about, really worked up about, guess what happens? You're like, I need something extra. I need something more. Apparently, all the things I've been doing to keep myself free of fear, I need something else, right? So that's why we buy something else. We take out another insurance policy. We go find a different job, whatever. This is what Thomas is doing here. He's saying, no, this isn't enough. Jesus, you're great. You're not enough. I need the Father. We need the big guns. Bring in the Father. Now, they don't have Trinitarianism quite yet. They haven't figured that one out yet, but he's, he's working on it. They want help. And we're the same way. We want Jesus to give us whatever it is that's going to make us not feel afraid anymore. What it is that's not going to make me scared. And these two questions basically are telling Jesus two things. I don't trust you and you're not enough. I don't trust you and you're not enough. You're not big enough to handle this, Jesus. I don't trust what you're saying and you're leaving, and I don't trust what you're doing, and I, I don't think you're enough. And we do this. We say this to him. Because we get scared, and in our fear, we start to push away from Jesus. We don't cling to him. And you know what Jesus does to these two disciples? Does he pull them aside and get in their face and be like, look, you've been with me for three years. Get it together, man. Thomas, where's the guy who wanted to go die with me like two weeks ago? No. You know what he does? He answers their questions. He answers their questions. Now, yes, he admits to being hurt. He says, have I been with you so long that you don't know this? But he really legitimately just answers the questions. See, our tendency is when we're afraid, we think Jesus doesn't want to hear from us. He wants to hold us at arm's length. He wants faithful disciples that don't get afraid. We want to be bold and daring. We don't want to be like all these other. Guess what? You are just like these guys. So am I. And Jesus says, I want to help you. Bring me your questions. This is why we're doing the dwell readings, guys. This is why we're in the word every single day. It's because we need to know the character of Christ. Because if you don't know who he is, you won't ask him questions. You'll be afraid to. He wants to meet you in your doubt. He wants to meet you in your fear. He wants to meet you in your questions. Jesus loves the questions. He gets asked questions all the time. Maybe the best way he can help you is just give you somebody to listen to. 
flip that. He wants to listen to you. But the greatest gift he offers is himself. Jesus offers himself. Look at verse six. This is in response to Thomas's question. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it'll be enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in, my, in me does his works. Jesus is telling them that, look, you got to stick with me. This is the crux of the passage. This is the I am statement, right? The I am, the way, the truth, and the life. The reason why it's so famous. There's a bunch of different ways to understand that sentence, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Probably what I think is the best way, and there's alternate opinions, but I think the best way is Jesus is saying, I am the way by virtue of being the truth and the life. So what makes him the way is that he is also the truth and the life. And so it's really important for us to understand Jesus as the way out of fear, the way out of being imprisoned by, by the habits that we fall into to avoid fear. We've got to understand what he means by truth and life. So let's start with life because we've talked about life several times over the course of this series. It's that Zoe word. The Greek word means abundant life, Zoe life, abounding life, the satisfying life, the eternal life that he has for you. And see, this is what fear does to us. We all have visions of Zoe life. And sometimes they line up with Jesus and sometimes they don't. But what we're afraid of, we're afraid of living our lives as a shell of the person that we thought we could be. I think this is what midlife crises is. You're like, wow, I'm pot committed to this. I gotta be free, I wanna break out, right? And so that's why uh, runners, right? The worst thing that happens to runners is like a knee injury. You're like, well, you can't run anymore. You gotta have knee replacement surgery. That's it, running career done. And some of you are like, well, I'm gonna run anyway. Good for you. I would long for the excuse not to run. Right? We're worried about becoming a shell of what we were, the cancer diagnosis, right? I gotta go through all this chemo and radiation. I'm not able to do the things. I'm a shell of what I once was. As you age, right, your, your appearance changes. That youthful beauty that I once had is gone, and I'm a shell. And what Jesus says is, I am the life. And if you make me the center of your world, the center of your life, I can't be taken away from you. Everything else will. It can be. Don't make me, or don't make things that are not, uh, that can be taken away from you, the center of your life. Don't make that the core of your Zoe. It's, it's going to disappoint you. But if Jesus is the, the center of your life, you put your faith and your trust in him, then he is your life. And he'll be the way in life. The other part is truth. It's a little more complicated when he says, I'm the truth, because John is writing at a confluence of ideas. There's the Hebrew understanding of truth, which is like faithful. So it's like, oh, that's a true friend. Travis is a true friend. He's reliable. He's trustworthy. The other version of it is, is the Greek version, which is like factual truth. It's the way we think of truth. Like Dallas is in Texas. That's true. And that's what we think. But Jesus is saying, I'm both of these things. I am both reliable and trustworthy, but I also grasp reality. Now, we already talked about the reliable part, so I'm going to talk about this grasping reality thing. When you're scared, we distort reality, right? The little, little uh, gremlins become giants. The giants become world eaters. Cows become monsters. When you're scared, your, your imagination just runs wild, right? You start thinking about all the things that could go wrong, that will go wrong. Those of you with anxiety, you know what I'm talking about. You, you start running out in these impossibly ridiculous scenarios. Those of you that don't have anxiety, you still tease out, well, this could happen or that could happen. And Jesus is saying, listen to me, stick with me. The way, I'm the way because I never lose sight of what reality is. All of us, we, we, we get focused on our discomfort or our jobs or our families and, and it's all we can think about. And Jesus is like, that's not how I work. I get focused on God's plan 
and God's will. And if you stick with me, I'm going to keep you on the path because I am the way. And the way, the truth, and the life. And that's how we come to the Father. That's how we come to the security. Jesus wants to give you permanent freedom from fear. That's what he offers to you. But I have bad news. There is a boogeyman out there. And it's not something spiritually real like Satan, although he is a boogeyman, I suppose. And it's not something fake like Dracula, okay? That's not real. Although there was a guy, I think, that was supposed to be. It's you. It's you. You're the boogeyman. You're the monster. I'm the monster. Maybe better, better said is it's the sin nature living inside of us, right? Have you ever see the Wolfman movies? Right, the werewolf movies? This guy, he, when, the, when the moon turns full, he turns into this monster and he just goes on a rampage and he always wakes up somewhere in the woods. I don't know why they wind up in the woods, but they do. And he's like, what happened? I don't know what I did. And this is what we do. We get scared. Life circumstances happen a certain way and we lash out at people. We yell at people. We, we, we say things we don't mean or we fall into those addictions that we wish we weren't a part of. We didn't do, but stress gets so big. We find it relaxing. We do all sorts of things and then we wake up the next morning and we're like, God, what happened to me? What was that? You have to go and apologize to people or you choose not to because you're like, well, maybe they'll just forget that I called them all those terrible names. I don't know what your plan is there. Just apologize, own it. We're just like the wolf man. There's this monster that comes out all the time. And we're looking for the silver bullet, right? We're looking for this thing that's going to take care of it. So we do the, the self-help things. We go to counseling, which is great. I'm a big fan. Talk about our meds and all that stuff. We go take a vacation. We think that's going to fix it. And then we come back and we're like, wow, I'm still dealing with the same stuff I deal with. That's because you know what a silver bullet does to the werewolf? to the wolf man. The problem with the silver bullet is it kills the wolf and the man. That's the problem. If you shoot the werewolf with the silver bullet, it kills both of them. But Jesus found a way to separate the beast from the person. And it was through him dying. He took the silver bullet. He died for us. That's why he goes to the cross to set us free from the monster that is ourself. And so when he goes to the cross, he says, trust me, believe in me. Let me be this thing that will heal you, that will cure you of this. And so you have an opportunity today to take his hand and to step out in faith and say, yes, Lord, I trust you based on what you've done, your death, your burial and resurrection to set me free from this beast that hounds me throughout my life and has hounded me throughout my life. You can live your life on the run from the monster that is yourself, or you can come home to Christ. That sounds exhausting. This sounds wonderful. You have chance. The band's going to come up here and talk about being set free from darkness. They're going to play a song. It's a new song about being set free from darkness. And while they're coming up here, I want to remind you that just because you've been set free from the beast, you've come to Christ, you've gotten baptized, you've done all that, that monster, unfortunately, sometimes crops back up, right? That's the thing, the Halloween movies with Mike Myers, they've made 12 of those. And they kill Michael Myers in every single one of them. And I know one thing that doesn't kill Michael Myers, bad reviews of his films, because he just keeps coming back. And that's sometimes how it feels with sin in our life. You still struggle with the same things. You're like, oh, I can't believe I'm still dealing with this. And Jesus says, you need to come to me. He's the monster slayer. You can't handle it on your own, but he can because he doesn't get scared. Just like I went to my mom that night, go to him. Maybe take your journal. Maybe you're doing the dwell readings. You, you write in your journal. What is it that you were afraid of that day? What scared you that day? And then off to the side, write how you coped with it. Maybe you cried, maybe you bought something, maybe you drank something, ate something. I eat, that's my thing. And then I want you to write off to the side, Jesus is enough. 
Jesus was enough to handle that, and Jesus is enough to handle the next thing. Jesus is enough. That has got to be the only thing. That's what he is, the way, the truth, and the life. That's how he operates. He's here to give you hope. He's here to give you help. But above all else, he's here to give you himself. Do not be so foolish as to not take him up on it. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the hope that you've extended to us through your Son, the help that you have given through him. But above all else, thank you for him, that we can be set free from the monster that lurks inside all of us, the beast within. We pray for each of us, Lord, that you would set us free so we might be safe with you. It's in your name we pray, amen.